Hello and welcome to another episode of Rico's Rants. I'm your host, Rico DiGiorgio. Uh, before I start, I'd like to state that this is my own op- personal opinion. This is my own story. I'm not looking to offend anybody. I have no wish to um, to cause any problems, but I definitely have to speak my mind and I have to talk about what's recently happened and um, my own story. Um, because of the shooting in Florida that happened last week, where 17 kids got shot, it made me think about something that I had gone through with my friend. Um, I've talked about my friend Michael, um, over the, over the previous rant videos, um, over the course of them, actually. Michael's one of my closest friends. I've known him since we were 11 years old. Easily, you know, one of my oldest and dearest friends, one of my, what I would consider a brother. Um, and one of, and when we were 13, we were almost shot by cops. Um, sorry to just be blunt about it, but like I said, I did do this video, so I have to redo it, so I'm going to kind of speed through it. We were, sh- we were almost shot by cops. When we were 13. Now, when we when we were kids, we were boys, young boys, and boys will be boys. Uh, just like girls are sort of aimed to play with dolls, boys are sort of aimed to play with guns and weapons and aggressive things. And to be fair, we did. There's something about having a toy gun and going bang, bang and shooting your friend, whether it's playing cops, robbers or laser tag, or even just playing star Wars or whatever the fuck, or just old fashioned warfare with BB guns. There is something about it. There's a sort of, it's a, it's a slight mythology in its own fucked up way. I mean, I, I wasn't, I was into guns, but my friends, Michael and Joe, were both, like, they knew what it, the kind of gun it was. Like, they could name off, oh, this is an AR-1, blah, 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 blah. This is an AK-47, blah, blah, blah. This is a fucking 1911, blah, 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 with a fucking scope. Like, they just knew that shit in the same way that I knew what Sinatra's favorite color was. It was just weird things. And it, I, we weren't alone. There were other guys that were, like, obsessed with learning about guns like you would about a car like they could figure out how to take it apart even though they never picked it up i knew guys that were like could theoretically knew every single part of a car but had never driven a car so it's the same sort of thing so it was sort of ingrained in our culture and it still is and i had shot guns my you know over the years, I mean, I have a farm, and, you know, in farm life, you have rifles, and you shoot at tin cans. We, we never hunted. Um, my father and I were very anti-hunting, and you know what? I don't give a fuck if you hunt, with the exception that, why hunt? You know, I don't, I don't really truly believe that it is a noble sport, because you're using a rifle, or you're using a heavy-duty gun. Now, to be fair, not all hunters do that. They, you know, they use bow and arrows. And I think if you are going to hunt, use a bow and arrow. That sounds like more sport to me. It sounds, you know, evening the odds kind of situation. But anyways, I digress. I'm not really hating on hate on hunters or I don't care, whatever. But I do have a problem with the fact that we, as a species, are the only species that hunts on a full stomach. Sometimes liquored up, too. Um... So Michael and I, we had only known each other a couple of years. We met when we were 11, and this about this time we were 13. And um, I was visiting him at his apartment, his mother's apartment in Sausalito. Now, Sausalito is sort of an upper-class, kind of overly news kind of way, um, where anything that's bad kind of gets immediately squashed. At least that was my experience. I apologize to my Sausalito viewers. Um, so Michael and I had toy guns. We had the guns that were plastic, yellow, green BBs inside. And, you know, you got shot, leave a welt, but overall it didn't, didn't draw blood. Just, ow, 
fuck? That kind of thing. So he and I are shooting each other in his bedroom at his apartment. And his mother told us, get the fuck out. Go out. Get out of here. You guys are driving me crazy. Now, that's not to say that she flung us out there without a warning. Both of our mothers and my father, and I presume his father, raised us with, don't go outside with these fucking things. Cops will shoot you. My mother in particular was very adamant about, do not go outside with waving these fucking things around. They will kill you. Cops kill kids all the time by mistake with, this, with these fucking things. And so we knew. We knew the risks. We knew the outcome. We were just young and stupid. But we also thought ahead, being like, well, we're going to go outside, but we're not going to fucking weigh these around. We had at least common sense to do that, to not do that. So where his apartment complex was, was it was three or four or five, something like that, five apartment buildings stacked in a circle. And right next to it, was a big hill with a bunch of woods, like trees and trees and woods, and we could just hide in there. So we knew enough that if we put the guns in our jackets or in our pants or something, climbed up the hill, went in the woods, dark, unseen, would be no visible, no one would see us, we wouldn't scare anybody, cops wouldn't mistake us, blah, blah, blah. Then we could play. We could be fucking stupid and play and shoot each other. So we did. We went up this fucking hill. We went in the woods. We looked around, made sure we were not going to be seen, pulled out the toy gun, and started shooting at each other. And up close, you could tell this was a toy gun. He had a big Desert Eagle looking fucking thing, and it was see through. But the light reflected on it, it looked like a metal gun. It looked real. And from a fair distance, it looked real. I had a typical fucking, you know, black. With a, with a brown handle and a orange tip. So you could tell it was fake, but I've heard of reports where people would like spray paint the orange tip of a gun, uh, spray paint a real gun with an orange tip to make it look fake to actually have a real gun. <laughs> so we're shooting each other for like, you know, 45 minutes. We're having fun. We're getting welts in our arms. And, you know, we're hiding behind trees and bang, bang, doing all that shit. And... At one point, I'm sort of out in the, sort of not out in the open clearing, but I'm more closer to the open, and Michael is behind a tree. And a woman, um, I want to say a middle-aged woman, um, comes out walking her dogs. And she's got about three or four of them, and they were poodles. And I remember that because ever since then, I have been fucking terrified of poodles. Um, you can laugh all you want, but standard fucking poodles are fucking terrifying, man. They are dangerous. I used to work, um, I had a job for like eight or eight months, um, where I was at a dog grooming facility, small, small little dog shop, um, nearby where I live over in Oakland. And my job was to wash and dry dogs. I was really good with dogs. My dad sort of like somehow talked to the owner without really even discussing with me and I got a job. And the most vicious dogs that I ever saw, apart from little fucking Yorkies, um, were poodles. And standard-sized poodles. Big, standard-sized poodles. And the bo the guy I worked for, who was the actual um, uh, barber, was a poodle trainer in his youth. Like, he actually trained poodles and respected them and loved them. But he told me, he said watch out for poodles. They will fucking turn on you. Like people assume like a pit bull would, a poodle can do it just as easily, if not more so. Especially purebreds. And to go with that, as every time I saw him like, you know, trimming poodles, because everyone wants their poodles haircut, um, nine times out of ten, I always see a poodle lunge at him. And he was respected. He was trained. He knew what the fuck he was doing, but just all of a sudden snap at him. So this woman comes out and sees me. And at the time, I'm 13. I was in considerably more uh, better shape. I, um, I was working out a whole lot more. I'm, I was not as overweight as I am now. I was not even close. 
Um, I had big muscles. I was working out constantly. My dad was making me do push-ups, and I was, you know, running, and I was doing push-ups and pull-ups, and I had I had muscles. I had a broad chest, and I had muscles, and and I also looked way older than I was. So to, at this day, at this point, I was wearing a uh, tank top, letting my muscles show. I was kind of being a tough kid, and I had a I had shaved my head, and I. At 13, I was able to grow facial hair, not as well as this, but for sure, I had more facial hair than your average 13-year-old. I just had, I mean, it was basically a goatee, but thinner. Um, but I looked older. So I kind of looked like a fucking skinhead in a really fucked up way. And it wasn't the aim I was going for. I just shaved my head, had, a, you know, a tank top and had a goatee and, and a fucking toy gun. It wasn't like, I'm going to look like this. I just happen to look like that. So this woman sees me looking how I did, holding the gun that I had, flipped out, dropped one of the leashes, and the dog chased after me. Now, the rule is, obviously, when a dog starts racing after you, you don't fucking run. But... Instinct sort of took over and I bolted and I'm just running as fast as I can. This fucking dog is chasing me and this goes on for like five to ten, eight seconds. It was not long and I look behind me and the dog is gone and the woman is gone. I kind of like, what the fuck was that? So I go back to Michael and I'm like, what the fuck, dude? And he's like, ah, I don't know, whatever. She took off. So we kind of go back. We're like, maybe we should go back deeper in the woods. So we went deeper resumed our shooting kind of but it kept it was lingering the whole thing it just like kind of ruined the whole thing we we're both like shooting each other and we heard a noise would stop and look and be like eh. kept the woman kept coming back in our minds and at one point we were so deep we had basically got to the other side of the forest and it was down we could see down the hill and we could see a highway and there was a scott uh, a cop car there's a squad car on the highway, just just parked. No lights on, just parked off to the side. And we're kind of looking at this cop car, and we're careful to be, like, in the woods, looking down. And I made a joke, and I said, maybe they're looking for us. And Michael looks at me, he's like, maybe they are looking for us. We should get the fuck out of here. And I'm like, actually, yeah, you're probably right. Let's get the fuck out of here. So we start walking back. And where we were at, at the entrance of the hill, there was this apartment building, because they're all super close to each other, but this one in particular was really up against the hill. And it was so close that we could have literally ran and jumped and gotten on this apartment balcony. That's how close we were. So we're making our way back, and there's this old man who calls out to us on his balcony and says, hey, you kids, there's a bunch of cops looking for you. I'm like, no shit, really? Why? Now, this is a part where it sort of haunts me to this day in a jokey way. I try, I mean, the whole situation is not funny. But this particular part is kind of funny. The man said, some old lady walking her dog said she saw 45 year old man with a gun so I look at my friend I look at Michael and I'm like dude she fucking thinks you're 45 because Michael is 6 foot 6 I'm 5'7 so even at 13 he was over 6 foot so I associate height with age and you, you would assume someone tall would be someone older right so I said dude she fucking thinks you're 45 what the fuck he said she didn't see me dude I was behind the tree she saw you. She thinks you're 45. And it just ooh, hit me like a bitch slap. Just, oh, really? Now, I knew I looked older because of the facial hair and, and you know, whatever. But I call it the Seth Rogen disease where you just look older than you actually are. I mean, I was the kid that when Michael and I and, my, and our other friend Joe want to get drunk i was the one who would like go to the liquor store and like buy the alcohol or get a cigarette i would have to like sometimes it would work without me saying anything but sometimes i'd have to like come up with a story about like how i'm from brooklyn yeah I'm fucking from brooklyn i flew in i lost my goddamn passport my passport's at the hotel i have to go back to get a pack of cigarettes can i just fucking made a whole big deal about it 
I was also an actor, so I was like, I used it as a way of acting, like, it was like, you know, ad-libbing and whatever. Um, it was method. Um, so, I was that guy. Now, I knew I looked older. I didn't know I looked that fucking old. Um, so, ever since then, every time it's my birthday, my friends will be like, So, Rika, you fucking 58 now? You were 45 when you are 13. Now you're 27. What are you, 57? Whatever the fuck you are. <laughs> Fuckers. So, that realization hit me. And I'm like, well, wait. How many fucking cops are after us? And he said something like 15 units. Like, an outrageous amount of cops were coming after us. Now, you have to think about the timeline. The date would have been 2004. So, 9-11 is pretty fresh. It's three years off. We're in the middle of a war. Everyone's a little over, overly gun-happy and a little overly paranoid. Bush wasn't helping. 9-11 didn't help. So, everyone's kind of getting a little trigger-happy and a little overly patriotic. Very much like, no one fucks with America. We're going to shoot all the fucking people with guns. And we're like, so... That's important to recognize because that is kind of what's happening now. Same type of thing, except the problem is, is on the inside, not foreign shit, if it even was foreign shit. So luckily, this old guy was an ex-cop. And we say, well, what are we supposed to do? And he says, well, I'm an ex-cop. And I guess he was listening in on the fucking, you know, frequency. He was just bored and retired and listening in and he caught Sausalito guns and he may have seen us walk up the hill so he knew what the fuck was going on that's why he was keeping an eye out for us and he says let me call it in let me tell them it's not fucking World War 3 let me just tell them it's not terrorists so we wrap up the guns in a literally we took the shirt like Michael was wearing an extra shirt we took it off him and wrapped him up in like a green or orange I can't remember which one and wrapped them up and set them down like 25, 30 feet away from us. We were like, we are not being near these fucking things. And we just waited. And he called it in, and I would, like, assume he would basically said, like, it's just a couple kids. Do not shoot on sight. Just a couple kids in T-shirts and toy guns. Do not shoot on sight. So we're waiting, because now they have to come by, and, like, they have to send one or two cops to take our statements, right? So we're sitting there, just waiting and talking to this guy. And I'm still like, it's not really hitting us what's about to happen or what is what could happen. We're still both talking like, man, that she fucking thinks I was 45? That's fucked up. That was the problem at hand. And then about two minutes later, we hear, put your hands on your head right now. And we look up and the hill that we were on, there was another small hill and there was four cops marching towards us in full-on body armor all their handguns were in their holsters, but unclipped. So, you know, they didn't have the strap covering it to, they could just pull it out easily. So, uh, one of them had a shotgun and the rest of them had assault rifles. So this was serious and this was fucking terrifying. And all of a sudden I'm hyperventilating. All of a sudden I'm, um, you know, thinking I want my mom. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, I'm on America's Most Wanted, I'm on Cops, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right now. So I put my hands on my head, and I'm freaking out. Michael, Michael, especially at the time, was really not a talker. I mean, he would talk to me, and he would talk to you know his family, but he was very much kind of a shy kid. Um, he eventually warmed up to people when he got older and was able to be more verbal. Whereas, I, I mean, Michael was sort of the epitome of the tall, dark, good-looking, mysterious, silent type, you know. And I was the sidekick. I was the short, fat, well, not fat. I was definitely chubbier than him. I, I was his sidekick. I was the kind of like, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do? That kind of guy. And I was always trying to make people laugh. I was always trying to be witty. So he's being his normal self, just silent as a, as just silent as something silent I'm, it's it's 4 a.m right now I'm, I'm not too witty right now and i am being hyperverbal 
and I'm babbling and I'm trying to explain to the cops that they are they're fake guns that we didn't we didn't mean to cause any trouble. We're trying. We just want to go home. We're sorry. We'll never happen again. And the cops' guns are near us. They're not. They're not pointing at our faces, but they're near us enough where if we moved or did something, they would have shot, raised it and shot us. It was that close. Like they were inches away from us. Um, so we're both kind of me. I'm trying just not to cry, and I assume Michael was going through the same thing. And they give us a talking to, and they pull out the toy guns, and they fucking say, these look fucking real. Like, I mean, they didn't say that, but they were, I'm paraphrasing, but it was the emphasis, like, these look real. You know that, right? And we're like, yes, we know they're real. We know they look real. We're really sorry. We'll never do it again. We're just, I'm just babbling uncontrollably. They write down our names and take our statements and and possibly there's a record of this somewhere. I don't know where, but um, somewhere there may be a, two kids, toy guns, whatever. Sausalito, somewhere. So they give us the guns back, which even now, and I've heard, I've told this story enough to other people where I've had, uh, excuse me, I've had different um, reactions to it. Most of the time, it's the same thing. Like, oh my god, that's that's terrifying. That's that's astounding that you went through that. But one guy, when I mentioned this, like they gave this guns back, he's like, well, of course, it's your property. But I'm like, yeah, even if it's our property, it's still we're still 13 and it's still toy guns. Like, could they have confiscated it? Could they have thrown it down the fucking canyon? Could they have done something instead of being like, here? This is the problem. We're going to give you the problem back. So we'll see you next time when you do this again. It's like, here, Leatherface, here's your fucking chainsaw. Here's here, Jason. Here's your machete. Just, if it's a problem, get rid of the problem. We were we would have been fine with that. It wasn't like, oh, man, what are we going to do with our toy gun? Like, we need a lesson. We learned our lesson. We would not have fucking fucked around that shit for quite some time, if ever. Uh, it definitely took the fun out of of playing with guns for quite some time. Let's put it that way. So we, they gave it back to us and they said, all right, go home, get out of here. You know, presumably we wasted their time. Admittedly, we didn't intend to waste their time. We felt bad that we did. They definitely went a little overboard to be fair, but, and that, you know, I mean, I don't blame the woman either, but you know, it was just a mind fuck of a, of a whole thing. Everyone was wrong in that situation. So we kind of gingerly, wobbly stand up. Legs are like jelly at this point. And I sort of was daring and ballsy and inquisitive. My father always raised me to ask questions and always ask why. So I asked one of the officers. I said, officer, if you you were looking for us and we didn't know that you were looking for us and you just saw us pointing these toy guns at each other and having fun and running around, what would you have done? And I swear, without missing a beat, the cop looks me dead in the eyes and said, I would have shot you straight in the head. Well, fuck, thanks, officer. I'm going to go home and change my underwear now. Thank you. So we kind of wobble back down the trail not speaking a word the entire time, back to his apartment. We go straight to his room. We close the door. We turn off the light. And we just stare at each other in the dark. Like, not to say it was our Vietnam, because I would never, you know, I would never compare this to someone who served in the military, especially in combat. But this was the most traumatic thing we had gone through. And this was pretty um, terrifying. And we reacted like we reacted, which was shell-shocked in its own way. We were just sitting there, staring at each other, numb, at a loss for words, not knowing what to fucking do or say. You know, we were terrified. We were stunned. We were 13, and we had gotten very fucking lucky. You know, this was a serious thing, and we got very fucking lucky. And 
eventually we, after like staring at each other and like looking around the room and kind of taking things a little bit more, um, take, not taking things for granted at that moment, we're just kind of like, I'm just so glad to be alive and be in this room right now. We started talking about what could have happened and what almost happened. And we're like, dude, do you know, it's like we almost fucking died today. Like that's the reality is we almost died today. And then the, the reality hit us where we had to tell our parents. And in some ways, that was almost more terrifying to do than what we had just gone through. Because we knew we were going to face that, oh my God, disappointment. We knew it was going to disappoint our mothers, especially my mother in particular, was not happy. And was very, very, very disappointed and very upset. Rightfully so. Dino, I know I love you too, buddy, but you got to fuck off. So, um, we told his mom. And she was a little bit more vocal and pissed off than my mother was. My mother came to pick me up. And I remember on the drive to my father's, I told her. I said, Mom, I have to tell you something. And I told her what I just basically told you. And she just went, I fucking told you guys. I fucking told you. Little boys get killed for this shit all the time. Why don't you ever listen to me? And to be fair, I listened to her a lot. It's just, and we, like I said, we knew the risk and we didn't intend for that to happen. We tried to avoid that, that situation. But situation changed on us. So... I ate crow and I did my whole thing. I'm nodding my head. I'm saying, you're right, mom. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. It will never happen again. I'm sorry. I just wanted to go home. I missed you. And I'm, you know, I just wanted my mommy. And after a while, she calmed down and gave me a big hug and realized, like, I almost lost my son today. And then she took me to my father's. And my father is a fucking, you know, radical, liberal, angry hippie, you know, very much against authority, against the establishment, blah, blah, blah. My dad was very much caught in the old world as well as the new generation because my dad is born in 38. So he was around the 50s and was, you know, in his 20s during the 50s. And then the counterculture came in and he sort of embraced him. But he didn't get so full-blown hippie that he was dropping acid every week and he was not really so much he was my dad was still old school in a new world he embraced both sides my dad was very much an anomaly and still is very much an anomaly he never really fit in his own world he was too radical for conservatives but he was too um conservative for the liberals he's just right in the middle um fucking dino's hair is all over my face. Um, I guess he's shedding. So I told my dad and my dad was, yeah, he was disappointed with me, but he was not really so much disappointed with me. He was more disappointed with what had happened and why it had happened. And he was more pissed off at Bush. He went on a whole tangent about Bush and cops and police and, and shootings and guns and blah, blah, blah. Now, I shot guns, and I have shot guns since, you know, we have a farm, we shoot tin cans, and blah, 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 and my dad always made me respect the weapon, he never told me, he told me to always treat it like a weapon, and not like a toy, you know, respect it, don't play with it, and you know, he taught me how to clean it, he taught me how to shoot it, I'm a pretty good shot, too, um, but I... I didn't want to touch again, uh, touch a gun again for quite a while. It was a really big deal to me. Now, at the time, I was heavily into writing. I was always writing. I was always reading. And my dad said, "You need to write this down. This is the you're the you and Michael went through something unique. You know, most people actually don't get to live through this scenario. You're very lucky. Write it down. Turn it in for extra credit. Keep it for your own self. Whatever." write it down and he was right and I wrote it down um, verbatim basically more or less what I told you guys just now um, and so and then I turned it in for um, I was going to turn it in for extra credit at school because it was also a a warning to other students and faculty like this 
all this happened to me, this could happen to anybody. Be careful. So, now, I don't really want to go deep into it, but Michael and I were very lucky because of one reason is that we were white. And I know that's hard to acknowledge and it's hard to hear and it's hard to say. And, and, and I don't, don't disregard that. I, I'm grateful that I'm alive. I'm grateful Michael and I got, you know, through it without even a warning shot. But the truth is, is that this happens a whole lot more to people that aren't white than people that are white. And I know that because my dad made a whole big deal about it because a week later, um, he told me that, he said, Rico, come here. And I sat down and he told me, he said, today, a black kid got shot because he was mentally handicapped and it was his birthday and someone gave him a cap gun for his birthday. And he's having fun, he's bang, 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 and having fun, and cops came by and shot him. And he was, you know, he had a mental disability, he may have been mentally retarded, um, he just, or, or whatever, I don't know what he had, but he didn't understand the circumstances, no one had really warned him to not go outside and do it, and he was gone down, riddled with bullets and killed. And my dad made a big point saying, this happens all the time. This is what your mother and I have been telling you. This happens all the time. You, he's like, you have to write this PS for your paper and tell about how white or black, Hispanic or Asian or fucking polka dots. Kid with a gun is a target. Don't be a kid with a gun. Don't carry a gun. No more guns. Toy guns are real. So, I remember writing the paper and adding that little fucking PS and reading it to my class and, you know, explaining that this is a big deal. And now, flash forward to now, the issue is that it is still an issue. This circumstance that happened in Florida last week isn't the same situation. It was not kids with toy guns getting, you know, almost shot or, or being shot by cops or other people. It was a fucking, you know, fucked up kid with a gun who went on a crime spree. And unfortunately, we, we're now in the day and age where we're not used to it, but we're used to it. You never get used to that tragic and, you know, riddling the fucking, you know, you know, a campus or a church or a school or a market or Las Vegas with fucking bullets. It's not a, the whole guns don't kill, uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people thing is a straight up lie. And I normally don't get political in my in my rants, but I can't just sit here. It's it's too heartbreaking to to just ignore. And I may not make a difference, but I at least have to tell my story. And the point is, is that there is a gun issue. Now I admit, guns are fun. It is fun to shoot a tin can or a bottle. And unfortunately, my I truly believe that that is the main issue why people that are afraid that the Second Amendment rights are going to be taken, they just want to fire their guns. They want to have their guns. It's fun shooting guns. I think it's more about that and less about protecting your family. It's, it's more about that and less about hunting. Now, to be fair, I don't have a gun. And I haven't gone hunting. So, in that aspect, I don't... You could say I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's fine. That's your opinion, and I'm just expressing my opinion. But what I know is, is that now Trump wants to fucking 
put make the teachers carry guns. You know, my dad was a teacher. My dad was a substitute teacher and an actual teacher. Teachers don't get paid enough to all of a sudden have to carry a gun. What Trump is describing, where people go into a facility where it's bulletproof windows, they have to stay there every day, lunch and dinner, and the supervisors and faculty carrying guns and are trained to use their guns and may have to use those guns on students, that's a prison. That is a fucking prison. That's not a school. That's not an education system. If the gun is the dangerous thing, where if a kid walks in with, with a gun and now a teacher or a principal or a fucking janitor has to shoot the kid, what what's the solution? What How does that solve anything? It doesn't. It just means another kid got shot for carrying a gun, real or fake. It doesn't matter at this point. Guns have to be treated like a driver's license, like a car. You have to pass a test. You have to be mentally fit. You have to go through major training. You have to have your eyes examined. You have to have it regulated. You have to be fingerprinted. You have to go through all that shit, and it shouldn't be at 16. You want to, you know, you can, yeah, people can still get car, uh, still get guns at a young age. But we can at least try and make it fucking difficult. It doesn't have to be that easy. It doesn't have to be that easy to ex access a gun. It makes absolutely zero fucking sense to me that you have to be 21 in California to smoke a pack of cigarettes legally. But at 18, you can go get a fucking gun. You can go off to war and kill someone, but you can't smoke a pack of cigarettes. You, you, it should not be, you know, gun, more guns is not the answer. It should be less guns. For all those people that want to carry guns and shoot guns and hunt and whatever and protect your family, just do what we all should do, which is go through the tests, go through the motions, have a license, go through proper training, go through every year, once a year, training to make sure you're still physically, mentally uh, fit to wield a gun that your gun has to be locked up at secure times that if you want to travel with your gun even in the car or in your boat you have to go through customs and be like I have a gun on me here's my license blah 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 that makes more sense to me than taking away the guns because the right to bear arms is a right but the right to bear arms was back then when they were in the they were having a revolution when they were needing guns. And back then, guns was a fucking musket. It was not the same thing. You couldn't go on a crime spree. You couldn't go on a, on a gun spree with a fucking musket. You shot one, maybe hit your target, and then loaded it for fucking two minutes. Gunpowder, all that bullshit. Pump, 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 all that. And then bang again. You know, it wasn't... The whole... The assault rifle that was used in that school is a military assault rifle. It should only be in the military. It should never, ever, ever, ever be out of the military. That is the whole point of a military gun. You know, it. but even still, even if it was a handgun, could he have done as much damage? Probably not. But he could have st still done damage. It just, it, it upsets me, and it breaks my heart that on one hand, maybe something will finally get done. On the other hand, I also, I don't have a whole lot of faith anymore, man. It's, it's, we're in February and we've already had so many shootings and we're in February. It's upsetting. It's, it's, it's disgusting. And Trump is not helping. It's not about taking away your gun. It's about making the license and regulations smarter to carry your gun. Your argument is what? Kids were kids were shot. 
you really care that much about holding your gun after 17 kids were killed, slaughtered by another kid? He was he was 19 years old. He was a baby in his own way. He's, I mean, his life is ruined. But not compared to the fucking families who have to bury their kids. They will never see their children again. Ever. Ever. They'll never see their children. Like that. So... I got, I, you know, I, this past week, I've been thinking about this and it's been hard to stomach and it's been hard to t think about because I could have just as easily been like that. Michael and I could have been winked out because we had toy guns, not even real guns. So with that, all I could say is good luck, be careful. Don't be stupid. Just, I don't know if this will end a fight or start a fight. And I'm not looking to argue with anybody. You know, I'm all for you expressing your opinions. All I'm doing is expressing my opinion. And I'm not even, you know, saying it's my constitutional right to speak my mind. I'm just, I just had to say my story. I just had to tell my story. Because I was one of the lucky ones.